So good morning, everybody. This is a new seminar under the program Severo Ochoa by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía here in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Hagai Netzer from the Tel Aviv University in Israel. And he will talk about the following black holes evolution from seed to all five mergers and outflows. Uh, Isabel Marquez, she's the director of the Severo, Pro, Severo Ochoa program, and she will introduce uh, Dr. Hagai properly. Isabel? Hello, good morning, everybody. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for being here again to, to listen to our, um, to our, our very well renowned uh, uh, researchers that we invite to give these talks. Um, and uh, today, uh, uh, here is with, with us uh, Professor Hagai Netzer. Thank you very much. Uh, Guy for accepting our invitation. Uh, it's very kind uh, uh, from you. And um, I just to make a, a kind of a, of a summary of all the, um, uh, the, the very, very exceptional uh, profile that we have in today, as you will see. Professor Hagai Netzer was born in Israel and completed his studies in physics uh, at the Tel Aviv University in 1972 and, uh, and defended his PhD in astronomy at Sussex University in 1975. He's been a faculty member of the School of Physics and Astronomy at Tel Aviv University since 77, uh, a member of the University Senate since, uh, since 87, and the incumbent of the Jack Adler Chair of Extragalactic Ast Astronomy since 94 to uh, um, 2011. Over the years, he chaired the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Tel Aviv University and was the director of the WISE Observatory the Raymond and Beverly Sackler Institute of Astronomy and the International Institute of Experimental Astrophysics. Since 2009, he's Professor Emeritus at Tel Aviv University. He has obtained several honors and awards during his career. Between 94 and uh, 2011, he was Jack Adler Chair of uh, Astrogalactic Astronomy, and he, uh, uh, he's also associate, wow. associate of the Royal Astronomical Society at the UK in, in 2003. In 2005, he obtained the Weizmann Prize for Exact Science in Israel and the Humboldt Fellow in Germany. In 2018, so quite recently, he got the Fellow of the Israel Physical Society. Professor Nasser has published more than 260 papers, uh, referred publications with more than 22,000 citations. So he's got an age of 19, uh, uh, sorry, of 90 in Google Scholar. He's also the author of several books included the physics and evolution of Arctic galactic nuclei, an advanced professional textbook that I strongly recommend for all of you interested in, in, in AGM. Um, uh, he has also written um, The Universe in, uh, in Hebrew uh, in 2013, which is an advanced text giving a comprehensive description of modern astronomy at the first year university level. And uh, he has also written Active Galactic Nuclei with Blumford and Walter, which is a graduate level textbook, a journey to the quest for life in the university, in the universe. Um, and during his whole life, Professor Netzer has had a strong commitment with education. It's also represented in, in, this, in his writing of, the, of these books. And uh, between 98 and 2016, he's been chair of the National Committee for Science and Technology in elementary schools and also being a council member of the Wolf Foundation. Professor Netzer research includes quasars and active galactic nuclei, star forming galaxies and massive black holes. And his research involves observations with ground-based and space-borne <coughs> telescopes, including the Hubble Space Telescope and advanced X-ray and infrared observatories. Today he's talking about the following of the black hole evolution from high redshift, Z equal to five, concerning mer mergings and outflows. Thank you very much, Hagai, and um, uh, again, so uh, thanks a lot. And, and, and we hope to, to be able to extend this invitation for an in-person one in the next future. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Isabel. I've been to Granada three times already, um, including uh, going around the city, so I'm going to, to call this one half a visit and I'm going to talk about following black holes since Redshift uh, 5. And le let me take a minute to remind you about the very well-known history of black holes. These are some of the famous names. <laughs> maybe you'll recognize all of the faces, maybe not. 
uh, Kerr, Hawking, of course, Beckenstein, Schwarzschild, and Wheeler. And I, I put this up to remind you that there was not a big theoretical discovery about black holes since 1974. This is before I got my PhD, and this is a long time ago. Uh, on the other hand, there have been many, many observational developments, which are the focus of my uh, talk today. But if someone wants to break this chain and bring about a very big discovery on the theory side, I will be the first one to praise him or her. So a, a very short reminder about feeding black holes. This is really not the topic of my talk. So uh, we, we know how black holes are fed and how they grow because of that. On the right side, you see the large scale view. This is a galaxy. I think it's NGC 1365. And if you follow all these lanes and dust uh, passes, it actually tells you how material goes from far away in the galaxy into the vicinity of the black hole. And we understand most of it. We can actually understand how material gets all the way to about an parsec. From the black hole, some people would tell you that even closer, so this is well understood now, dynamical and observational studies. And on the left side, you see uh, numerical simulations of the accretion disk. The black hole is on the left, and this is the accretion disk. These are, of course, numerical simulation. And it shows you uh, that the amount of accretion or the rate of accretion marked here as m dot change the structure of the disk. So on the top, you see a, a relatively low accretion rate, 0.01 Eddington. On the bottom, something which is about 10 times fast, faster. And you can see how the black hole or the accretion get, this get brighter and thicker. And we have different names for this, thin disk, thick disk, slim disk. Again, this is not the topic of my talk, just to mention that we know how the process goes all the way from the galaxy to the black hole. And I'm going to talk about the various scales of this process using uh, new observations. So uh, I'm going to, to show you, in fact, again, doing it only in one minute, a, a how or why we think that we know how to measure a black hole mass. This is talking now about black holes in centers of galaxies. And um, we, we know this, and excuse me for not going into the detail, because uh, many of these objects have very typical uh, a signature, very typical spectrum. And uh, we have developed a system called reverberation mapping, a method which take into account the fact that uh, what you see in this cartoon is that on top of the black hole and the, and the accretion disk right next to it, there is a system of clouds the obvious is it don't look like this, that go around um, the black hole in bound orbits. And we don't know the exact ways they do it, but because they go in bound orbit, we can actually use uh, very simple Camplerian physics right in here, uh, not first year, high school physics, if we know the distance between the black hole and the clouds, and there have been many attempts, successful attempts, to recover this distance, we know how to measure this distance. And once we know the distance, and we know the velocity from the line width, from the bocal motion, and we know that this is a bound system of clouds, we can actually solve for the mass. And this is the main method. It's almost the only method so far to measure uh, the, the black hole mass, black hole mass in centers of galaxies, all the way to the end of the observable universe with quite good accuracy. Uh, so until about um, three years ago, that was the only method. And now we have another method, which is a direct method. Um, a brand new, extremely challenged, challenges extremely promising using uh, the VLT and an instrument called gravity. Again, I'm not going to go into all these, uh, but it shows you in a very graphical, simple way that you build a very large interferometer that operates in the near infrared in the K band. And you can measure things to incredible accuracy. And what this allows you is actually to, to make a picture if you want. It's slightly not accurate what I'm saying here, but it's really make a picture of the very center. And in this demo, each point here 
is one of the black of the what we call broadline region clouds. It's one cloud going around the black hole, and uh, one can see when one can measure the velocity of the clouds. Here, blue is going towards us, blue shift, red is going away from us, red shift, and their location. And when we, we have these, we need the orientation in the sky. In this particular case, we can measure the orientation and then solve the black hole mass. And this is more accurate. Uh, so far, there are only two objects where this was done in such a way. But I think there is, is a very bright future for this instrument and, and amazing plans to do something uh, with it for the next maybe decade. So there are two methods, but what I'm going to talk about today is based on the first method, which gave us most of the point. When I say most, how many do I mean? I mean many tens of thousands. So far, if I look at the literature, I can count, everybody can count black hole measurements based on the first method, which amount to maybe 100,000 some people, 100,000 black holes, each one in a separate galaxy, of course. And uh, in, in this picture, therefore, I show you many of them. In fact, I, I should say I show you only about 20,000. But you can see from the picture that uh, 20,000 give you a pretty good idea how they distributed as a function of redshift or as a function of the history of the universe. So on the left, you have the Big Bang, on the right, you have today, almost 14 billion years later, and each point is an active black hole, black hole accretion matter, where we can measure the mass. And the mass is, is a sign here on the left-hand side. And you can clearly see that this method is much more difficult and therefore produce many less, many fewer objects below redshift of about two, and that for practical reasons. And above redshift two, there are many, many points. So when I look at such a diagram, putting everything together, I can kind of show you the history, the evolution of black holes, which will look something like this, starting from very early on, maybe 700 million years after the Big Bang, and going all the way to today. But of course, this history is built by looking at many different black holes. So at each redshift, I pick another black hole and then I say, in fact, I claim that what you see here as a, in a very schematic way is the history of the most massive black holes in the universe. They start when the, the mass is low, below 10 to the 8 in this uh, thing. It goes all the way up to about 10 to the 10 solar masses, 10 billion solar masses, and then it stops. So it, it does nothing after that, meaning the black hole is of course there and remains there for the rest of the time in the center of the galaxy, but it's not accreting any matter and therefore we don't see it. So uh, the, the black part, horizontal band here, meaning black holes that are not active. How we know that this is correct? Because we observe in the local universe and we do see black holes with mass, which is roughly, even if exceeding slightly, 10 to the 10 solar masses. So we know they exist and we think that this is the information. This is the, the, the past history. If I want to uh, show you or, or point to you a possible evolution of a black hole, which is at mass of about two times 10 to the end, 10 to the eight now, or just a short time ago at very low redshift, this may look like so. I, I'm not sure about this part. Here, we don't have observation to tell us at what redshift it started and the exact path. So this is very different from the very massive black hole. And, and the, the reason is simple, it's observational. When you go to redshift here, it's redshift of about three or four, there is a limit to, how, to the faintness or the brightness of the object we can observe. We simply cannot observe them, they're probably there, but because we cannot observe them, we cannot say much about this, but here, it's probably doing something like that. So, so in principle, especially when we're going to have more observations of, of lower luminosity black holes, accreting black holes, uh, in the future, we will be able to, to pave, to show the entire history of each black hole. Of course, it differs from one case to the other, 
but it's roughly looking like so. So we actually understand this issue very, very well observationally. So how do black hole grow? Uh, there are two ways. Uh, the, the most efficient way is they, they attract, they, they accrete metal from the galaxy, a metal comes all the way from the galaxy to the vicinity of the black hole, go through the accretion disk, and then accrete to the black hole, produce an awful lot of, of radiation during the process, and the black hole mass increases. There is another way through galaxy mergers. This is an image of, of two galaxies in the nearby universe merging. And as the galaxy gets closer and closer, so do the black holes in the center of the two galaxies. And the process looks schematically like this. And eventually the two black holes will merge and we're going to end up with a black hole with a mass which can be roughly twice the mass of each individual black hole. Of course, the two do not have to have the same mass, but this is another way. Uh, so the galaxies merge into a bigger galaxy. If they're spirals, it's most, they're most likely to form an elliptical galaxy. The two black holes merge into one and the mass increase. The first process of accreting material from the galaxy or through the galaxy, <coughs> it's much more efficient. Uh, probably 90% of the mass of most black holes that we see, most black holes that we see, uh, is via, <coughs> excuse me, direct accretion, not by, via this process. So um, what happens in the early universe is very high redshift. What about the environment where this takes place? Because I have to say something about it because I'm going to take you all the way to redshift five or close to five. So we know from simulation on the left side that um, the universe starts something like what you see here, uh, a filaments of gas and, and location of high density, <coughs> excuse me, low density that eventually form galaxies and, and uh, in their centers, uh, black holes. Uh, you see a 3D picture on the, on the left. Again, of course, these are simulations. Uh, the 2D picture that you see on the right, again, simulation, is intended to show you that when these filaments merge or collide or interact, the density increase, galaxies are forming, and in the centers of the galaxies, black, hair, black holes are forming. Of course, in the beginning, these are very small black holes, and then they start growing. So that region well, there are many stars shining and many black holes, many of them active at that time, and region where there's much less material. In 3D, it will probably look something like this. Again, simulation. So all this is simulation. So we can see two dimension of this picture. It's exactly the same simulation as, I, as you've seen previously. What about the third dimension? Can we map them in 3D? And the, ans the answer is that in many cases, in many locations we can. Because in many locations, you can assume that all this is certain redshift, maybe redshift two, all this structure. And if there happened to be an active black hole, a quasar, a at, at high redshift in this region of the sky, the light from this quasar will go through this material and show you, give you a spectrum like this. And in, in this spectrum, you see a very simple absorption spectrum. You see some places, now I'm going to call them filament, where the column density is low, and therefore you see a weak line or a narrow line. And in some places, like here, uh, the, the amount of material, the column density is so large, in this case it's neutral hydrogen, that you see a very, very uh, uh, deep and a very uh, flat bottom, very broad line. So we can actually map many regions over the sky depending on the lamppost, whether or not we have quasars that can shine through them. And on the whole, if we want an average number, we can get an average number, we can say nowadays in average way, not in individual uh, cases, we can say that at redshift two, the overall density between galaxies was so-and-so, the column density, because we can map them in three dimensions. So 
having said all this in a way on the introduction, let me uh, take you to Redshift 5. In fact, it's Redshift very close to Z4.8. And, and the reason it's at Redshift 4.8 is because we chose this Redshift to, to enable us to measure black hole mass. So I'm going to tell you about a, a relatively large sample about 44 objects at such a high redshift, it is large sample. In fact, it's the largest flux limited sample. All objects at about the same, in fact, very nearly the same redshift. That's an advantage because you don't have to worry too much about evolution. The, the age of the universe at that time was about 1.2 billion years. And I'm going to, to take you uh, through a series of paper, but this group of people that you see down here, uh, Benny Trachtenbrot is a former student of mine, he's now a faculty member at Tel Aviv University. Paulina Lira is our collaborators uh, in, in Chile, Santiago for many, many years. And, and, and uh, Nathan uh, is a PhD student working with Paulina Lira. And so it's, uh, I'm going to summarize for you um, a series of papers starting in 2011, ending this year with an emphasis on the more recent period. And what we try to do, we try to measure four different quantities in this sample. The first two are the star formation luminosity and the AGN luminosity. So the AGN luminosity is very simple. Here are, these are typical spectra obtained with a VLT of uh, one, two, three, four, seven or eight object out of more than 40. And we, we can see enough of the continuum to estimate to a pretty good accuracy the luminosity of the AGN. I call it LAGN. This is the luminosity. These are extremely luminous objects. As I told you, we have to see them clearly at redshift five or close to five, so they have to be very luminous. And then regarding star formation or star formation rate, we use Herschel that you see on the right here. And Herschel photometry in the far infrared allow us to, to fit the far infrared continuum of these objects and estimate or measure star formation rate. So after we do this, uh, this was done for the, for the same sample, all 40 objects, we can uh, put together a diagram that looks like so. Uh, in this diagram, you don't see 40 objects, you see 18. And the reason you don't see 40, ob 40 objects is partly because or mostly because some of them, three quarter of them were below the detection limit of Herschel, too faint in the far infrared. So we could observe all the object in, in, the, in the near infrared, but not all of them in the far infrared. So all the blue ones are measurement by Herschel, all the red ones are upper limit. We have many more upper limits. We have in fact measurement, but, but the, the other nine, out of the remaining uh, 20 or close to 30 have actually been observed also by ALMA. I'll come to this in a few minutes. And right now, what I want to show you or impress you with is the fact that if you look at luminosity of the, AL, of the AGN drawn here on the bottom and the star formation luminosity here, you see two distinct features, two distinct groups. The objects that are more luminous in the far infrared, meaning the star formation rate is higher, as are also more luminous in the near infrared, meaning LAGN is also larger. So we have objects where both the star formation luminosity and the age luminosity is high, and we have objects where they are low. Now, both are very high luminosities, even for the red sources, but these are even higher, just to give you an idea. Uh, the star formation rate that goes with this, with this luminosity is between 1,000 and 3,000, in fact, 4,000 solar masses per year. So these are the most, the most rapidly star-forming objects in the universe at around redshift 5. And, and even here, even the red points, the, the star formation rate is very high. For those of you who walk in this area, it's maybe 400 or 500. It's extremely high, but, but still a much smaller than in this group. So these two properties, star formation and AGN accretion, 
know about this. Definitely at Red Shift 5, so there's a big argument whether they know about, about each other in the local universe, but that's a different issue. So this is a two of the four quantities that we want to measure. The other two are related to the mass. So um, we also want to measure stellar mass and black hole mass in this redshift. But measuring black hole mass uh, is easy. I showed you that in, in my second or third slide. Measuring uh, stellar mass is much more difficult and for that we need ALMA in order to measure the mass of the entire galaxy. So here is ALMA. Just to remind you that at this, uh, at this redshift, what people call very good high resolution ALMA images look like so. Okay, so this is what we can do with ALMA with the great resolution, even, even though we are talking about large objects just because of the redshift. Nevertheless, one can do quite a lot about it. And um, before showing you the result, I have to remind you an important thing that in the local universe, this is the local universe, there is a very clear relationship between the black hole mass in the center and the galaxy mass, showing here schematically, the larger the galaxy mass, the, the larger the black hole mass. <clears throat> and let me show you what we can tell about the high redshift universe. So first of all, in all the galaxies and host galaxies, now I'm talking about the host galaxies of the AGN, uh, we can measure the carbon to 158 micron line. And since we measure the line, here is one example, we can only, we can also follow the velocity field. ALMA is actually an IFU, integral field unit uh, uh, measurement. So you measure location and velocity. Here is one example, the same object. And you can see that one side of it, this is in the, in the line of the line, in, in the light of the line. You see that one part of it, red going away from us, red shifted, and the other one blue is going toward us and we can use this velocity and the distance from the center to estimate now the mass of the dynamical, of the dynamical mass of the entire galaxy. So ALMA allows us to measure a, a stellar mass, dynamical mass, and I say dynamical and not stellar because there is a lot of gas there too. And, and the VLT allow us to measure black hole mass. And so now let's put them once against the other. This is a complicated diagram. So let me take you through it. The, the, the black points that you see here are local measurements. You see that at the right top, these are galaxies that with stellar mass approaches 10 to the 12 solar masses and with black hole mass of order 10 to the 10. These are the object at the top. You see that when we go to smaller, a, a smaller galaxies, the black hole also gets smaller. So the black points, black circles, are all from the, from the local universe. The colored one, we use the same system of coloring, a red and blue are object in our sample. And we can do this for 18 objects. And you see that they sit in a very different location. And the one thing I want to, to show you more clearly is the fact that if we draw lines, this line, for example, is a case where the galaxy mass, the stellar mass, is 100 times larger than the black hole mass. This line here is the galaxy mass, stellar mass is 10 times larger than the black hole mass. And all these objects, except for two, are between 100, 1%, and 10%. So in all these objects, the black hole mass is some 10% of the total mass. It's incredible. 10% of the total galaxy is all inside one black hole. <clears throat> and even cases where we suspect it may be more than 10%, of course, the, the uncertainties on the stellar mass are very large. So I'm not going to claim this specifically, but you can see that the black hole are huge, are really huge, not only in absolute terms, they approach 10 to the 10 solar masses, but also in the fraction of the galaxy, 10% of everything there can be inside one small black hole in the center. So we know about these properties, and let us me continue with one more properties related to redshift five. 
And this is about a companion. So, so one thing, because Alma gives us a very large view uh, by comparison, uh, you can see that in some cases on top of the black hole, which sits here, there is a companion. And we find this in five objects out of 18. It's a small sample, but it's one third of the objects show companion. How do we know it's a companion? Because also this object, the companion, shows an emission line, the same line. So we know the redshift and therefore we know it's a companion. In this particular case, the distance between the object and the companion is about 20 kiloparsecs, I'm sorry, maybe 25. And this is very common. <clears throat> very surprisingly, there are more companions to the faint far infrared luminosity object than in the bright. And it, it is surprising because one co a common wisdom in the, in the issue of, of why star formation is very large in some object is that there is a process, there is a time in the life of a galaxy where two galaxies collide, merge, and during that time, star formation goes up a lot. It can be go up by a factor of 10 or even larger. But in our cases, if merging, mergers are related to companions, in fact, the objects that show more companions are the ones who are fainter in the far infrared. So something here is not really telling us the same story as, as we see or claim to see in the local universe. Let me show you this in a different way. So what I did here, I put on top of the actual map, the previous mass of simulation. This is, this is not a real map, of course. I just scaled everything to put right here a very bright object. So you can think about this as the quasar with the Earth's galaxy. And to put here a smaller, less bright object, fainter object, which is a companion galaxies. So the, the one thing to remember from this is that unlike the real map that you saw earlier, the, 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 all the space between here and there is not empty. So there is a lot of material, most probably neutral hydrogen, between them. You've seen this when I show you how to map the, the, how to map the 3D mapping of regions of the universe. We know that there is a lot of material. So, so you can think about it, perhaps, I cannot tell you about this specific case, about a companion which is large by itself going through a lot of material, it's not empty space, around or towards or away from the host galaxy of the AGN. So it's a very complicated issue, may or may not be related to future mergers or maybe past mergers of the system. So let me try and summarize this one and start the, the next uh, part of my talk. Uh, so here is the same diagram again. And here is what I suggested to be the path of the history of the object at redshift 4.8. 4. Now I can t show you, I can tell you that the group I was talking about is this group. Okay, this is redshift 4.8. This is the group. All the points here and many and, and a few more are from our study. In fact, the blue ones are also from our study. The, the same group of people that you saw earlier. So this is the uh, this is a kind of a history of the most massive black holes in the universe. And now the question that I want to ask and, and try to answer in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes at most is what happens here? Why is it that this black hole shines all the way up to about, it's about redshift two roughly, depending on the object and then quench, then stop. The, the, the black hole is not accreting anymore. And in fact, we know that the galaxy is not growing anymore, not very much. So we think, and that's again, common wisdom. It's not my idea, it's, it's a common idea that something happened here. So some event, most people included including me, will, will, will associate it with a big outburst, a big outflow originating perhaps from very close to the black hole that sweep material, sweep material away from the galaxy, outside of the galaxy. We call it an outflow. And, and this outflow, if it really can take the gas away from the galaxy, <clears throat> excuse me, it stops star formation and black hole 
grow simply by, by, by removing the, the fuel out of them. No more gas near the black hole, so the black hole stop growing, no more gas to produce stars, and the galaxies stop growing. That's, of course, a highly simplified uh, scenario, but it makes sense. It makes sense. So, so this idea was the beginning called feedback. Uh, in fact, this specific one called negative feedback, one that stops star formation and, and black hole growth. So there is also positive feedback, which I will not talk about today, that, that enhance them. This idea uh, started was the motivation for many studies. The most detailed one are in the local universe, not in the hybrid shift universe. And I'm going to, to focus now for the next 10 minutes or so on results that I'm associated with, but there are many, many, there are several, in fact, many other groups doing similar or slightly different type of research. And I will try to include the results from other uh, groups too, but uh, of course, because I know them better, I'm going to, to focus on our group. So what can we say about feedback and outflows in the local universe? I'm going to focus on the local universe. So the first thing that I'm going to show you, and well-known fact, that there are ways to detect outflows from the spectrum. So if we take this part of the spectrum, you can see here two oxygen three lines and H beta, a typical spectrum of an AGN, and, and zoom on it. In some cases, this is an extreme case, you see the sum of the line. In this particular case, it's at the oxygen three a double, doublet, 5007 here, 4959 here, one of the sp strongest narrow lines in the spectrum of all quasar. So there are two components. There is a red component, which I call line core, typical characteristics of gas which is staying there, not doing anything dynamically, not anything exciting dynamically, just moves around in the galaxy. And then there is a blue wing. In some cases, there's also a red wing. And, and the blue wing tells us or suggests to us that uh, there is some material, quite a lot of material. You see that this wing is quite, in, uh, quite bright, almost as bright as the narrow one. Uh, this material is going towards us and therefore we see it blue shifted. And you can see the same wing also in the other line. This is a very clear case. Other cases are not so clear, but there are many, many cases where we see this. So we can take this information and look in the spectrum of local object and try to deduce from wings like that and wings that we see in other lines several important quantities. One of them is the mass of the outflowing gas. The other one is the mass outflow rate of the outflowing gas. And the third one is the kinetic energy, translating the previous properties to energy of the outflowing gas, and then compare it with the total energy and luminosity in order to, to see or to understand does it have enough energy to remove gas from the galaxy and thereby and therefore stop quench star formation, stop black hole accretion? So uh, this is our group. Dalia Baron is a PhD student of mine. Uh, Prochaska is from Santa Cruz, from Lick Observatory. Eric Davis is from MPE, uh, Garshing. And, and we are going to, to uh, uh, focus on some object that will be examples for well-known facts that are listed here. Outflows are clearly observed in many AGN, in many AGN hosts at all redshifts. I'm going to focus on local, to, fo to focus on local redshift. Outflow can clear up gas from the galaxies or stop star formation and stellar mass growth. And of course, in our case, uh, AGN uh, black hole growth. So regarding the picture, the one on the left is simply M82, a very a very uh, well-known star from the galaxy. You see in, in, in kind of pinkish or, or purple, it's a wind coming from the galaxy. A very, very nice, uh, a very nice picture known to many astronomers. And in, in, in white, you see the, the stars in this galaxy. So definitely there is outflow in this object. In fact, in many star from the galaxies, Sometimes people call them uh, star burst galaxies, extreme star from the galaxies. There are definitely winds and we see them 
very clearly. The, the picture in the middle is you see the stellar population of an object at redshift, very low redshift, about 0.1. So in kind of an orange, you see the stars, and in fact, you see indication of a merger. One galaxy here and one galaxy there. Uh, and then I marked in dashed line a region to the bottom right, and where you see no stars at all. And what I'm showing you on the right is an image of this in the light of oxygen-3. In the light of oxygen-3, you see that this part, which extends all the way to 15 kiloparsecs from the center, the galaxy, the stars that you see are going only to three or four kiloparsecs, 15 kiloparsecs from the center or even more, is full with very highly ionized gas uh, that moves away, is outflowing. So there's definitely something here that takes a lot of gas or some gas, I didn't get yet to the point of measuring the amount, away from the galaxy and potentially stopping star formation in the entire galaxy, definitely in this section that we see here. And here's another good example, like the previous one. These are IFU observations. The previous one was done on the Keck. This one is a MUSE, an IFU uh, unit, integral field unit a spectrograph on, on the VLT. It's a different object. What you see here on the top the red contours are the stars, the bluish stuff is gas. And what you see here on the bottom is that we take all the gas and, and divide it into many, many different regions, about 80 of them, 80, 80. And in each one of them, we measure a full spectrum of all the emission lines. This is how IFU observations allow you to do this. And in each one, we can say a few things about it. First of all, we can separate the location of the stationary gas, which I call the narrow lines, which we call narrow lines, and the location of the broad outflowing gas. And you see that the broad outflowing gas is closer to the center. It's a different galaxy, so don't look for this cone here. It's a different source. And those of you who like uh, diagnostic diagrams and what they tell us, and I won't go into detail here, I can, I can tell you that for each one of these pixels, 80 of them, we can draw the BPT diagram and, says, and say whether it behave like a Cipher galaxy or a liner or a composite. I, I don't want to continue along this line, but this in itself is very interesting. For example, the, the composites are the green points here, which mean that star formation is extremely important. So, so you can see what one can do with I a few observations, and then what we do for each pixel, we model not only the amount of gas on the gas emission, the gas emission, but we also model the velocity because I a few let us measure velocities. So we know the velocity, we know how much emission is produced in emission lines, so we can translate the emission line flux into mass for the gas in the center, outflowing gas, this will give us the amount of mass in the center or everywhere where we see outflow. And if we then use the velocity, we can tell what is the mass outflow rate, okay? Because if we take the bus and divide by the time, for example, the time it takes the gas to reach from the center to the location that you see it, we have mass outflow rate. And the combination of these two can be used to estimate the total kinetic energy in this outflow. We can do more than that because in this galaxy, and in fact quite a few others that we are working on now, we also saw absorption, see absorption, I'm sorry, coming from neutral gas. This particular one is in sodium, sodium D lines. Again, I don't want to go into spectroscopy too much, but that's a neutral line coming from neutral sodium, quite common. In fact, you can see it in stars, the, the, the green line everywhere are the stars, sodium in, in stellar atmospheres, but the black line is, is the total absorption, which is stronger. So we know there is gas around, neutral gas, because this is sodium one, neutral sodium, that also, uh, is going away, and I know it's going away because the emission here of this gas emission line 
is right at the systemic velocity and the absorption is to the left of it here, blue shifted. So, so there is also a, a blue shifted gas, which we can translate to amount of sodium and therefore the amount of neutral hydrogen outflowing from this galaxy at every location if we have high field observation at every location. So not only we can measure a, a, the, the, all the properties for ionized gas from oxygen three lines, for example, we can measure it also from neutral, for neutral gas. This is some kind of a sketch of a model. The observer here is on the left and uh, there is absorption of sodium here in blue, the blue shifted and the emission that we see comes from here. Again, I don't want to go into the details of the model, this is not my point. I want to show you that in some cases, these are very challenging observations. In some cases, we can measure both ionized emission and absorption. And in the ionized gas, it's only emission and ionized neutral emission and absorption in the same galaxy, in the same locations. So we can combine them, all of them, together into some kind of a global view. And this is a, meant to be a, a summary of almost everything that we know now. And when I say we now, I include uh, several other works by other groups, not only our group, uh, uh, that try to summarize what do we know at this time in the middle of, of the coronavirus attack on the ionized flows, neutral flows or outflows, and even molecular flows at this time. So look, look at the, uh, on the left-hand side, this is a diagram that contained about, I don't know, more than 100 sources. The different colors mean different samples. On the bottom, you see the AGN luminosity, and on the side, you see the mass outflow rate from the galaxy. And you can see some kind of a correlation. It's not very clear. If you look only at the blue points, these are the objects that are more, sim more uh, luminous. It's maybe there. If you look only at the, at the green points, green crosses, these are the less luminous objects. They're still very luminous. I wouldn't call it a correlation. So it, it's, it, we're still at the stage where we do not know if there is a clear correlation and whether if there is a correlation, is it mostly for high luminosity object, low luminosity object? This is a combination of many. So my summary of ionized outflow now, based on, on many different samples and many objects, a few hundred objects, is that uh, the mass outflow rates are probably correlated with luminosity. But when I work out the kinetic power, it's a very small fraction of the total age and luminosity. It's of all the 1% of 1%, or some 10 to the minus 4, or something like this. Now, according to all the simulations and calculations, theoretical calculation, this is not enough to blow away enough gas from the galaxy to stop star formation. So the common wisdom, and common wisdom is what used to be the case, or people used to think until about half, six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, that the, the, the kinetic luminosity is much higher, is not true anymore. And this is related to a wrong way of measuring densities that we found. And again, I, I, I want to save you the details. I want to show you the big picture. What about neutral outflows? Now, this is based on, on very few objects. I would say about 10 or 20. We are working now on a sample which will give us another 20 or 30. So the statistics is not as good. But what we can say now is the mass outflow rates of neutral material, mass outflow rates are larger than in ionized outflow. I don't want to put numbers there, but they can be, the object that we are looking at, they can be larger and therefore the kinetic luminosity is larger by about a factor of 10 or maybe even 100. So when we do the sum of all the material that goes and leave the galaxy, we need to take them into account. More than that, we actually have to take also into account the third component, and this is the molecular outflow. And molecular outflow, the numbers here are even smaller, but they are coming along 
become more and more objects, in this case, mostly in the high range of the universe, that give us the indication, suggest that the amount of outflow rates are larger than a neutral outflow, which in themselves are larger than ionized outflow. So it seems that regarding the galaxy, what, what makes or cause most of the damage, what's remove most of the gas from the galaxy, are probably molecular outflow. And of course, this ought to be done on an object by object basis. So I'm coming to my summary about the cosmic evolution of black holes and their host galaxies. Again, the same diagram as earlier. Let me put again for you my preferred history for the most massive black holes. And then my preferred history, a generic type of history, just an example of what can be the case of objects that are maybe a hundred times less massive. And I told you that not only we think we know that in many of them, probably maybe the majority of them, there are some events in the history, in this particular case, a Mahai Masman, a, a very far back in the history, at redshift two or three, that stops these processes, big outbursts or something similar that remove the gas from the vicinity of the black holes, therefore the black hole stops its accretion. And, and the stellar mass also ceased, stellar mass growth also ceased because the, all the mass was removed from the galaxy. So this is probably, if, if I had to put here, here the, the history of the host galaxy, it looks something like that. What about the other line? So, so this one stops, stopped accreting at, this is rate shift of about 0.1 or 0.2. I see, I only see the time here, so I don't know the exact uh, rate shift. But there is a big difference here, and, and the, the difference is that we don't think this is a single event. We actually think that there, are, there have been several um, scenarios, several episode periods of growth and, and stop growing in the history of, of this object, which schematically, <coughs> excuse me, which schematically may look like so. So this is in one slide kind of a summary what is known about this population and what can one can do with observations at high redshift and at low redshift regarding growth, regarding mergers, regarding outflow. And I told you about all of them. So here are the, the points that, that I talked about uh, here. And I want to thank you and I want to tell you that I'm going to count this as half a visit. So I really hope that I'll have a chance to come and do the other, the other half in person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Haray, for this night talk. And I open the talk for questions. Please, for all the participants, raise your virtual hand and I will give you the word and ask your question. Here I have uh, Isabel first and then Juan. Isabel, please. Okay, I, I am mute and I put the, uh, the video as well. It's um, more personal. Uh, thank you very much, Haray, um, for such a nice talk, that first thing to do. And of course, you are invited to complete the other half. So we, you, you will have at the end one visit and a half because the next one, I hope it is Complete. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, you deal with the coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but it's a promise. You, you are invited and we, we will, I mean, we'll do it. Yeah, thank you. And um, um, so, so my question was concerning the, the plot you've shown, you, you j just shown us as, as an overall summary. And it's related so, so with, with the reason, why, what's the reason for stopping the accretion at that particular redshift for the, for the big one, for the... Um... <clears throat> okay, so there may be two reasons. You, you mean, what is the origin of the outburst of the, of the beginning of the outflow? Okay, so, so there are two, several possibilities that have been raised. Is there all two categories of possibilities, one which we call a, a black holes outflow or, or, or 
or AGN outflow, and the other one is star formation outflow. So, so we know that star formation can also cause uh, a, a outflow, mostly by supernovae and, and, and stellar wind from early type stars. And there are cases, we see cases where we think that the outflow or the origin of the ionized outflow is actually from stars and not from the black hole. Regarding a black hole, it's, it's not very clear. Uh, the, the, the idea that I like is that it starts very, very close to the black hole in what some people would call X-ray outflows. There are indications in the X-ray that in some cases, very luminous object, there is a huge outburst, presumably from the accretion disk. I don't think we understand this. But what we try to follow once we see this is what can happen, and it's a complicated process. This outflow, which is very energetic when it's very close to the black hole and the accretion disk, actually hit on material, the ISM of, of the host galaxy, uh, heat it up, there is a shock, and all this material is moving, shocked material going through the galaxy, and this shock is actually a, a remove the rest of the material from the galaxy if it's powerful enough. So I would say that I don't know, I don't think anybody knows the origin of this, but we see them. Uh, and, and so these are two different categories and, and there are other possibilities. I, I mentioned only one, radiation pressure from the AGN when the AGN is, is very active, doesn't have to be very, to start very close to the center. It can start from the Nippon region, we know all about this, and then move the material more slowly. But again, it may have enough energy to, move, to remove it outside the galaxy. Uh, we don't know too many details of these two processes. But, but I, I was meaning mostly with the origin of why this happens at that particular redshift. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. But if it is the black hole, I would say that it should be related. It would be related to an episode of very fast accretion rate on the black hole something that exceeds the Eddington accretion rate. So there is a lot of energy produced in the vicinity of the black hole. And then this is the, the, the start of it. All, all the object, by the way, that I told you about at Redshift 5 or 4.8, the accretion rate uh, in units of Eddington, they all Eddington, L over Eddington, there is one, very close to one. And I would guess that this is the case in other uh, places. Very high accretion rate, causing an explosion by definition. It's super Eddington, and that's what starts the process. I don't think we know more than that. Okay, thank you. So, so I, I, I guess that it's related to the, to the mass you have because, because of the two different lines, right? So the that's processes right. are different for low masses than for high yeah, masses. Yeah, yeah. I, I would think so that the magnitude of the outburst is very different in the two. Okay, thank because you. Because yeah. Thank you, Sabal. Now, there is a question by Juan Scudero. Please, Juan, open your mic. Hello. Um, sorry, because I think I had some trouble with my speakers at, at the time, but as I read from this figure, uh, the, the outburst uh, uh, or whatever it stop, it stops the creation happens at some definite redshift. Which is well, at, uh, which here is like at two point six giga, giga years or something like that. But that happens for every kind or mass of black hole. You're talking about what we call relativistic uh, outflow. Is this what you're asking about point two c? The thing that stops the the growth of the okay, black hole. Yeah, okay. That thing, um, it happens for every type of black hole at the same time, at the same no. age of the universe, but it, it should vary, uh, vary from one black hole to another? No, I, 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 I don't think it is, um, partly because I know this is not the case. I can look at the observation of these outflows. These are very, very high velocity outflow. I think this is what you mean. They reach point to C very fast outflow, and, and we only see them in very luminous objects. <laughs> so, I, and I think this is not a coincidence. I think uh, a less luminous object, uh, we, we, we don't see them for a reason. 
the energy is not enough to do it. I don't think we understand the reason because oh, everything to do with luminosity in, in, in AGN is, is really the luminosity relative to the black hole mass. And, but still, we see this very fast outflow only in very luminous objects. So it must be telling us something important. It's not in every object. But uh, I think uh, what, I, what I mean is that it seems that this change in the curves or in the mass of, or, or in the growth, sorry, it happens at the same time in, instead of at the same time in the life of a black hole. Um, no, I, I wouldn't say it's the same time. I, I would say that once it happens, there, it's going to remove the stars and that's it. Uh, in, in the very, very high luminosity black hole that you see here on the top, on the top left, um, the, the, it happens, it doesn't have to happen more than once in order to remove all the gas. And then there isn't enough gas around, now I'm talking about the vicinity of the galaxy, to allow further growth. So it's, it's shut the supply. So I wouldn't call it the same time. It's, it's the same period in the history of the universe. Maybe that's a better way to describe it. And, and this period depend on the black hole mass. And there is any reason for why in that period, it happens in that period of the universe, instead of being dependent on the... On the I would say... Light? I would say that it's related to the amount of gas in the vicinity of the black hole, in the vicinity of the galaxy. What is the potential of this galaxy to grow even further? If this galaxy is in a not very crowded part of the universe, there is so much gas that is right already there, and then it can happen once or twice and that's it. If this galaxy is in the vicinity of other galaxies, there may be a future merger, a merger in this particular system that will bring more gas from another galaxy that collides with it, or maybe from the interstellar, intergalactic, so medium. So it's probably the, the vicinity, the surrounding of, of the galaxy, which is the host of the black hole, that tells you what will happen. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is another question by Cristina Ramos. Please, Cristina. Hello. Hi, Hagai. Hi. Regards from the Canary Islands. <laughs> um, so I would, I would like to ask you about the, um, so what you talk about at the end, about the outflows. Uh, you didn't mention it this time, but uh, so the work that you have uh, been doing on the outflow densities, together with Dali and with Rick, Mm -hmm. and um, and also the the group done by by our group led by like that hunter we are mm -hmm. showing that the outflow densities are much higher than what people usually derive from the sulfur lines in the optical yeah. <clears throat> yeah. but uh, so and, and because of that we are getting even lower uh, kinetic uh, energies for the outflows for the ionized outflows but you know what's your opinion on uh, other groups have proposed that perhaps using our method we are picking up like the densest part of the outflow and there might be like a lower density material within the outflow that we are missing what's your opinion on that okay so, so what christina is talking about are two two different methods that uh, develop to understand or to measure the density and they both show there are different methods they both show that the density that people used to assume earlier is wrong, is wrong in a sense that it's too low. And, and the, the issue is, and I'm not going to take you through equations, is that the lower the density, the higher the total mass is, and the higher the mass outflow. So, so your group, uh, Christina, used a, a sulfur two line ratio, oxygen uh, two line ratios, and we used an estimate based on the ionization parameter. And um, in your method, uh, it may be the case. I don't think you can rule it out because it's very challenging to measure what you have managed to measure. Extremely challenging. So yes, it's a possibility, but I, I don't see the, the reason to suggest it, mostly because 
our method is, is easier to apply. And in our method, we don't see a real difference. We don't see a real difference between galaxies, between different locations in the same galaxy. So why is it that one method uh, will tell you now that the density is higher, much higher than people used to think, and the other method limited to individual places? I really, I really don't think it's the explanation. I really don't think so. Thank you. Okay, we have another question here by Pepa. Please go on. Hi, hi. Hi, Pepa. It's really a pleasure to have uh, you here. Same here. But the, in this stupid system like the Zoom, I am very tired of, of these Zoom meetings. I like to coach <laughs> my people, as you know. The, well, I I appreciate ma very much uh, the tour you you have given. Um, as you know, I am very worried about uh, how is the role of uh, Eddington ratios in all the evolution of uh, of AGMs, uh, because um, well, I think that uh, that we are. We are now, in fact, we are looking for outflows mm -hmm. in very low Eddington ratio system. And still, we have uh, a large percentage of mm -hmm. outflows. Uh, and then, of course, uh, ionized gas outflows that maybe that if we look to the, to the molecular are, are very different. Uh, so that, uh, if I understood correctly, you are looking to the higher uh, Eddington ratio system. Um, and do you expect some that uh, these outflows uh, have some difference, some goes uh, in the kinetic energy or something like that? goes with the luminosity or goes uh, increase with the Eddington ratio or what? Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the high redshift sample that we use is of course very high luminosity, very high Eddington ratio. The, the low redshift samples that you, you've seen uh, from our group, these are not low, low, not high Eddington ratio at all. It's of, it's of all the, it's a fraction of a percent. It's not high at all. I, I know that many of the objects that you're looking at is even lower, like liners and such. So it's not as low as that, but they're not very high. I would say that they're typical or even below, below typical. The other thing that I can tell you is that we try to look for a correlation of mass outflow rate and kinetic energy with the Eddington ratio, and we didn't find anything. We did not find anything. So I would consider it an open, an open question. And when you come to do it, you and me and other people, I think we have to be very careful about what we associate with AGN outflow and what we associate with star formation driven outflows. In many cases, it's the second. And so we have to be careful, but I, I don't, I do not see a correlation with the Eddington ratio. I don't. I doubt if there is any, but we definitely don't. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Haray. And I hope to see you soon yeah. in person in the Institute. Okay, yeah, I hope so too. Thank you very much. Is there any other question for Haray? Seems not. So, thank you very much, Dr. Hagai Netzel, for this very nice talk. And uh, we can close the talk here, unless Isabel wants to say something. Uh, I wanted to try to put the camera again, but I'm, I have a problem there. with the mouse. That's okay. So I wanted to thank again, Hagai. I mean, all, all the people attended to, the, to, the, to this uh, colloquium, of course, and Hagai especially. Um, I've, I've been attending a number of your talks and I love them all and, uh, and I'll take the opportunity to thank again and, and, and confirm 
uh, with the very big letters, the invitation to come to Granada as soon as we can. Thank you very much.